Chapter 3 What They Ate and Wore and Where They Bought It With lack of hygienic standards, the established purveyors in the slum districts, from street vendor to corner grocer, sold food that would not today be considered fit for human consumption. Otto Bettman, 1974, page 109. Introduction The Necessities the three necessities of life are food, clothing, and shelter. The evolution of the standard of living between 1870 and 1940, with respect to the first two, is considered in this chapter, whereas the next chapter treats the evolution of the quantity and quality of shelter, including the role of electrification, indoor plumbing, and central heating in revolutionizing life within the home. In contrast to the changes chronicled in the next chapter, those treated here are evolutionary rather than revolutionary. More important than changes in what people ate in war was a set of epical changes in how their food and clothing were produced and where they were purchased. As America steadily became more urban and as real incomes rose, the share of food and clothing produced at home declined sharply freeing some of the time previously engaged in household production. New types of processed food were invented, and many of today's name brands became commonplace in the last three decades of the 19th century. The initial food and drug legislation in 1906 began the long process of ridding the food supply chain of rotten meat, diluted milk, and intentional measurement errors. With urbanization came the convenience of the chain store, which allowed shoppers to purchase most of their food requirements in one location, instead of several smaller specialty stores. The transition of clothing from home production to market purchases was accelerated by two late 19th century inventions, the large urban department store and the mail order catalog. Department stores in the large cities starting with Wanamaker's in Philadelphia in 1876, not only greatly increased the variety of items available, but also lowered prices through their efficient organization. The mail-order catalogs, notably that of Montgomery Ward, starting in 1872, and that of Richard Sears and Alva Roebuck, starting in 1894, ended the isolation of rural America and made visible in printed pages the ongoing explosion of variety in American-made manufactured goods, including older goods that were becoming steadily cheaper, such as nails and hammers, as well as newly invented goods like bicycles and sewing machines. The chapter begins with budget studies to identify the evolution of the share of household consumption spending on food, clothing, and other categories, and then examines evidence of shifts in the broad categories of food consumed. Treated next are innovations in food production, food marketing, food quality, and safety. The implications of food consumption for nutrition are then examined through the lens of biometric studies of adult height and other physical characteristics. The treatment of clothing is briefer. A central theme is the shift from home-produced clothing, particularly for women and children, to market-purchased clothing made available in abundance by mail-order catalogs and urban department stores. The chapter concludes by assessing the numerous reasons why conventional data on prices and output understate the contribution of food and clothing to the growth in the American standard of living. The Surprising Persistence of Spending on Food The record of U.S. food consumption in the 19th and 20th centuries implies a startling conclusion. Calories of food consumption hardly changed over the past 200 years, at least up until the past three decades. Figure 3-1 plots average calories consumed per person for each decade between 1800 and 2011. For the decades before 1980, there were wiggles up and down, but little overall change. Consumption was 2,950 calories in 1800 and 3,200 in 1980. The subsequent discussion of other measures of food consumption should be viewed from the perspective of relatively constant calorie intake. 
Food is the most basic of the three necessities, food, clothing, and shelter. When people are poor, most of their household budget is spent on food. Then, as their incomes rise, they can afford to spend more on clothing, shelter, and other goods and services that add to the pleasure of life, but that are not necessities, including on personal care, such as for purchased haircuts and entertainment items such as movie theater admissions. The first known budget study for the United States was conducted by the Massachusetts Bureau of Labor, MBLS, in 1874-75. Inspired in part by the MBLS study, the newly formed U.S. Bureau of Labor, BLS, undertook large-scale studies for 1888-91, 1901, 1917-19, and 1935-36, the results of which are summarized in Table 3-1. We use the Consumer Price Index, CPI, to convert the nominal numbers on total expenditures into real terms. The resulting levels of real total expenditures per household are shown on the bottom line of the table in 1901 prices. The annual growth rate of real household consumption between the midpoint of 1888-91 to and 1901 was 1.99% per year, followed by much slower annual growth rates of 1.06% between 1901 and 1917-19, to and then 0.95% between 1917-19 and 1935-36. Because consumer spending increased from one survey to the next, we would expect the percentage spent on food gradually to decline. But this is not what is shown in Table 3-1. In the first three columns, spanning the years 1888 to 1919, there was virtually no change in the expenditure shares across categories and particularly no shrinkage in the expenditure share of food, which varied only between 41.0 and 43.0%. With so much of the consumer budget dedicated to food and no change in total calories consumed, there is little room in this interval for a major improvement in the standard of living, unless it occurs in the variety and types of food consumed. Clothing and rent round out the traditional three necessities, and fuel for heat and light qualifies as a fourth necessity. The total share of spending on the three categories of clothing, rent, and fuel was relatively stable across the four surveys and summed to 36.4%, 36.7%, 39.7%, 36 respectively. It was only in the 1935-36 to 36 survey that food consumption declined below 40%. This made room for an increase in the miscellaneous sundries category from 19.2% in 1917 to 19 to 29.3% in 1935 to 36. What were these items? They included spending on insurance, medical care, tobacco, haircuts, meals away from home, Furniture, union dues, church contributions, and public transit fares. What people ate, adding variety to a boring diet. The best source of changes in the consumption of particular foods is the USDA time series of apparent consumption of food. We are presented in Table 3-2 with a cosmic sweep of data on the consumption of specific types of food over 140 years. The top section of the table records the consumption of various types of meat and immediately poses a puzzle. Meat consumption declined from 1870 to 1900, with lower pork consumption more than offsetting increased beef consumption. Then, after 1900, meat consumption of both beef and pork declined precipitously. By 1929, total meat consumption had declined by one-third from 1870. Beef had declined by a quarter, and pork by fully half. Consumption of lamb, mutton, chicken, and turkey taken together did not grow at all between 1870 and 1929, and thus did not offset the declines of beef and pork consumption. Which food types replaced the decline in meat consumption? Categories registering increases included fats and oils, fruit, milk products, eggs, sugar, and coffee.
whereas flour and cereal products declined in importance. The decline in pork consumption was part of the antidote to the boredom of the American diet already described in Chapter 2. As processed foods were invented and became popular, households found more satisfying ingredients and could vary their meals. The 1870 breakfast of pork and grain mush by the 1920s was replaced by cornflakes and other packaged cereals and citrus fruit juice. Although the variety of the diet improved after 1870 in the North and West, the Southern diet, based on pork, corn, and game, remained the same for decades. Previously prosperous planters were now impoverished, and only a small upper class carried on the tradition of fine Southern cuisine that had been practiced in plantation kitchens before the Civil War. By one estimate, Southerners ate twice as much pork as Northerners in the last third of the 19th century. A doctor from Georgia commenting on the high rate of southern pork consumption in 1860 wrote, The United States of America might properly be called the Great Hog-Eating Confederacy, or the Republic of Porkdom. North or South, critics of the typical diet singled out the American addiction to the frying pan. Flour fried in fat is one of our delights. Donuts, pancakes, fritters are samples of what we do with good wheat flour. Fried ham, fried eggs, fried liver, fried steak, fried fish, fried oysters, fried potatoes, and last, not least, fried hash await us at morning, noon, and night. Even before the development of refrigerator rail cars in the 1880s, the urban diet by the 1850s benefited from the reach of unrefrigerated rail transport. Upstate New York supplied northeastern cities with fresh milk. Vegetable farms surrounding the big cities provided vegetables in the summer, and even fruit came from as far away as Florida and California. The Lynn's detailed survey of life in Muncie, Indiana, distinguishes between the winter diet and the summer diet in the 1890s. In the winter, the main foods eaten were meat, macaroni, potatoes, turnips, coleslaw, and cake or pie for dessert. Preserved pickles were used for flavoring. A common complaint was spring sickness, resulting from a lack of green vegetables over the winter. Vegetable gardens were almost universal in this medium-sized city in which almost everyone, even the working class, lived in single-family structures. A major change between the 1890s and 1920s was the increasing availability of fresh vegetables in the winter as a result of refrigerated railroad cars and in-home iceboxes. Just as in Muncie, in most medium-sized cities and towns, the population lived in single-family dwellings and usually had access to garden plots to grow their own vegetables. It is possible that the USDA data displayed in Table 3-2 misses a substantial portion of the increase in urban consumption of vegetables made possible by these garden plots. There was a stark difference between food consumption on the farm and among the poorer classes in the growing cities. Farmers were not entirely self-sufficient and sold their surplus of preserved pork, grains, and vegetables to acquire sugar, coffee, shoes, and crude farm implements. Urban dwellers required cash income for all their food, and the macroeconomic depressions of the 1870s and 1890s created a large underclass of people who avoided starvation only by consuming meager rations provided by soup kitchens. Undernourishment caused deteriorating health, aggravated in the larger cities by crowded living quarters incorporating minimal light and ventilation. Another view of changes in food consumption after 1909 is shown in Table 3.3, which measures food intake in three ways. By food consumed, by pounds of food consumed, and by daily number of calories consumed. The food consumed index is weighted by food prices per pound and rises if there is a shift, for instance, from one pound of low-valued food, such as potatoes, to one pound of high-valued food such as steak. It is evident from this table that there was hardly any change in food consumption between 1909 and 1940, as measured by food consumed, pounds of food consumed, or daily number of calories consumed. 
which register annual growth rates, respectively, of 0.22%, negative 0.21%, and negative 0.18% per year. We can calculate the unit value of food consumed if we divide food consumed in the first column of Table 3.3 by the pounds of food in the second column. There was remarkably little increase in the unit value between 1909 and 1929. Instead, the main increases occurred after 1929. The bottom section of the table shows that there was an increase in the unit value at an annual rate of 0.40% per year between 1909 and 1940, and slightly more rapid 0.51% per year between 1940 and 1970. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, immigrants bought an increasing variety of foods. Among the upper classes, French cooks were prized, and cookbooks were full of French-inspired recipes. More relevant for the working and middle classes was the influence of German cooking, especially in cities populated by German immigrants, including Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. The Germans brought new ways of cooking pork, new types of sausages, sauerbraten and sauerkraut, not to mention German traditions, such as Christmas cookies and Christmas trees. By 1900, the Nuremberg custom of serving sausages with a piece of bread had made its transition to the American hot dog in a bun said to have been first sold at Coney Island. Italian immigrants brought ubiquitous restaurants and showed Native Americans many new ways of cooking and saucing pasta, already familiar as macaroni since the early 19th century. In the late 19th century, the use of ice to cool railroad cars and ice boxes was described as refrigeration, long before the invention of the mechanical refrigerator. Though few homes had ice boxes in 1870, they became common in the South during the 1870s and 1880s, and in the North a decade afterward. Large northern cities used more than five times as much ice in 1914 as they had in 1880. Ice was delivered by horse drawn wagons well into the 20th century. Wintertime deliveries from the coal wagon were replaced between May and October by deliveries from the ice wagon. As early as 1879, the U.S. Census found that ice consumption in large cities amounted to two-thirds of a ton per person per year. Food processing and refrigerated shipping brought an increased variety of fruits and vegetables. And by 1903, California growers had developed a lettuce called iceberg that remained fresh as it crossed the country. At the same time, the use of iceboxes continued to spread. In a 1907 New York City expenditure survey, refrigerators were present in 81% of the families earning $800 per year or less, and in 90% of the higher income households. However, this definition of refrigerator hardly equates to our use today. In some cases, it is reported that the ice is kept in a tub. In some cases, an ice box is reported, which is often hardly better than the tub. But in the majority of cases, the refrigerator serves as a place for keeping perishable food as well as for keeping the ice itself. Refrigeration was able to reduce the price of many perishable items, reduce seasonal fluctuations in prices, increase the shelf life of many items, and ultimately increase nutrition and the stature of individuals. We return to the issue of stature below. For now, we quote the conclusion of Craig Goodwin and Grenis on the benefits of pre-mechanical refrigeration. The upturn in nutrition and adult stature coincided with the adoption of mechanical refrigeration in the storage and shipping of perishable commodities. Refrigeration contributed significantly to the spatial and temporal integration of the U.S. economy in the late 19th century. The estimated impact of refrigeration on calorie and protein intake was in the neighborhood of 0.75 and 1.25% respectively. As much as one half of the improvement in nutrition in the 1890s might have been directly attributable to refrigeration. Just as patterns of food consumption changed over the decades, so did those of alcoholic drinks. German immigrants drank more beer than native-born Americans.
and Italians drank more wine. But we must be careful in our interpretation of data concerning aggregate food and drink consumption, such as those provided by Stanley Liebergoat, who for most products has created the best available data on consumer spending by category over the three decades between 1900 and 1930. Unfortunately, Liebergoat takes the word prohibition literally, and he records the share of alcohol consumption in total food consumption as being 15% in 1914, yet exactly zero from 1920 to 1930. Liebergoat appears to ignore Clark Warburton's important book on the economic effects of prohibition, in which Warburton sifts through a wide variety of data to determine how much alcohol was actually consumed and at what prices during the prohibition years of 1920 to 32. Data on consumption of alcohol by volume understate the effect on nominal expenditures because prohibition pushed up prices. Warburton concludes that alcohol consumption in 1929 was five billion dollars, fully five percent of 1929 GDP. This was higher than Liebergoat's estimate of four percent of GDP in pre-prohibition 1914. Thus, we reach the ironic conclusion that far from eliminating spending on alcoholic drinks, prohibition actually raised the share of GDP devoted to spending on alcohol. From cornflakes to catsup, the rise of processed foods. The first three decades after 1870 witnessed enormous growth in manufactured, i.e. processed, food. Starting from a diet dominated by basic unprocessed food products, there was substantial growth in consumption of canned and dried fruits and vegetables, processed butter, cheese and margarine, processed flour, hominy grits, oatmeal and breakfast food, refined sugar, macaroni and noodles, pickles, preserves, and sauces, bottled mineral and soda water, and the large category of processed meats, including fresh and cured meats, such as sausages. Before the 1880s, grain was converted into flour in neighborhood or regional mills. The gradual transition from home production to market purchases included bread. In 1850, commercial bakeries produced less than 10% of the bread consumed in the United States, and by 1900, this ratio had increased only to 25%. Bread and other baked goods had been manufactured for centuries, but the share of marketed baked goods grew only when households could afford to switch from baking at home. A 1929 survey of farm women in upstate New York reports that about half baked all or most of their own bread. By the 1920s, taste and preference were more common reasons than cost. The processing of food greatly accelerated after 1870, but had existed for centuries. Crackers dated back to the 18th century and had long been a staple of the larder of naval ships. Large commercial cracker bakeries expanded in the 1850s to satisfy the demand for the sale of crackers in barrels, a staple of country stores. The process of canning had been invented as far back as 1809 by Frenchman Nicolas Appert, who developed a process of vacuum-packed hermetically sealed jars for food. Although the Appert system was maintained as a French state secret for years, by the 1830s, two Englishmen who had recently arrived in America succeeded in duplicating Appert's technique. One of these was William Underwood, who led the switch from glass jars to tin cans, perfected in the 1840s, and who would soon become famous for America's first registered trademark, granted in 1867 to his Underwood's deviled ham and turkey. Another of the earliest entrepreneurs of canned food was Gail Borden, whose entrepreneurial career was worthy of his contemporary, Horatio Alger. According to legend, he had been shocked by the Donner Party disaster, in which a group of pioneers snowbound in 1846 in the Sierra Nevada resorted to cannibalism for survival. Borden was determined to perfect a method for reducing or condensing food so that it would provide nourishment in a relatively small package. The invention which made his name and fortune was condensed milk. In 
which he patented in 1856. Soon the Civil War would provide a ready market for his canned nourishment among the northern troops and sealed his success as an early pioneer of canned food. Many American men had their first experience of canned food as Union soldiers during the Civil War. Some of their favorites included not only Borden's condensed milk and Underwood's deviled ham, but also canned pork and beans provided by the Indianapolis-based Van Camp Company. Another early branded product, still in use today, was Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce. Although isolated examples of canned fruits, vegetables, and seafood had appeared, production in 1870 amounted to less than one can per person per year. Home preserving did not take off until after 1900, despite the introduction of the mason jar in 1859 because of the perceived difficulty of the techniques and the relatively high price of the sugar needed for preserving. Canned foods were slow to be accepted in the eastern parts of the country because of expense, worry about contamination, and housewifely pride in putting up one's own food and admiring the rows and rows of mason jars with their colorful contents. It was in the frontier west that canned goods first reached widespread acceptance primarily because they were the only way of introducing variety into an otherwise monotonous diet. An 1865 comment extolled the role of canned goods in the West. Few New England housekeepers present such a variety of excellent vegetables and fruits as we found everywhere here, at every hotel and station meal, and at every private dinner and supper. Corn, tomatoes, and beans, pineapple, strawberry, cherry, and peach with oysters and lobsters are the most common. Families buy the cans in cases of two dozen each. And every backyard is near knee-deep in old tin cans. The years 1869 to 1900 witnessed the development of nationwide brands produced by firms that became much larger than those started in the Civil War era. These included Swift and Armor for meat, as well as General Mills and Pillsbury for flour. Although H.J. Heinz had developed his 57 varieties by 1900, there is no evidence of spending on canned vegetables or condiments in the detailed food listing included in the 1907 New York City budget study cited above, nor in the listing of food quantities in Table 3.1. The iconic Coca-Cola brand was invented in 1886, but it remained a soda fountain drink until its first bottling plant was established in 1899, so most of its growth occurred after 1900. The same goes for prepared foods, such as Jell-O, invented in the 1890s. Other firms that had become established by 1900 included Campbell's Soups, Quaker Oats, and Libby's Canned Meats. Particularly successful immediately after their invention in 1894 were cold breakfast cereals, of which the first, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, was accidentally produced by Dr. J. Harvey Kellogg, a physician at a sanitarium. Soon competition emerged with the 1897 introduction of Post Grape Nuts, invented by C.W. Post, who was a former sanitarium patient of Dr. Kellogg. Cold cereals were a convenient and labor-saving alternative to hot mush. The interval between 1890 and 1920 marks the transition, thanks to mass production and industrial economies of scale, from expansive brand-name products available only to the middle class and rich, to mass market acceptance by working-class households. By 1900, the American food processing industry already accounted for 20% of manufacturing output. In 1910, more than 3 billion cans of food were manufactured, or 33 cans per person, per year. The broad reach of individual entrepreneurs extended even to what we would now call junk food. Two brothers, Frederick and Louis Ruckheim, began as humble street vendors who sold an improbable mixture of popcorn, molasses, and peanuts at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 and by 1896 had perfected their recipe, obtaining the trademark of Cracker Jack, which was soon advertised and available across the nation. In 1905, Frank Epperson, age 11, 
accidentally left a powdered soda drink outside overnight with the stirring stick inside. He awoke to find a delicious frozen concoction on a stick, and for some reason waited until 1923 to patent his discovery as Epsicles. His children had another name, and it stuck. Popsicles. Soon afterward, in 1928, Walter Deemer developed the first bubblegum, which he named Double Bubble. The next transition beyond canned food was the wide variety of frozen fish, meat, vegetables, fruit, and prepared dishes that have become common in the post-war years. The frozen food industry was still in its infancy in 1929. Its entrepreneurial genius, Clarence Birdseye, had made his essential discovery of how to capture flavor in frozen foods on a trip to the forbidding climate of Labrador in 1912, where he observed how the local Inuits preserved frozen fish. After the inevitable tinkering, he was ready to launch his line of frozen foods in the 1920s, although initially progress was slow because ice boxes could not maintain frozen food at a sufficiently low temperature and mechanical refrigerators were slow to become common in households because of their expense. The spread of frozen food would have to wait for post-war America when, by 1950, refrigerators would be sufficiently advanced to feature substantial frozen food compartments. Which manufactured and pre-processed foods were consumed in 1900? The New York City Household Budget Study provides precise quantities of foods purchased in six sample households, and here we summarize expenditures in a household having the income closest to the average of the sample as a whole. The father, male income earner, was a shipping clerk, making $760 per year, to which was added $104 from a lodger. There was a wife, a boy of 12, and a girl of three. The budget was enough to provide the father with 3,685 calories per day at a cost of 35 cents per day, and amounts consumed by the wife and children are converted into man equivalents. Weekly food expenditure was $7.04, or $1.01 per day, which includes 35 cents for the father and 66 cents for the other three members of the family combined. From today's perspective, the family's 10.5 pounds of meat consumed weekly, beef, corned beef, mutton, and chicken, seems almost extravagant. Divided by the four members of the family, this comes out to 136.5 pounds per person per year, somewhat below the national average of 190 pounds recorded for the year 1900 in Table 3-2. Added to all that meat in the family's weekly diet, were two pounds of fish and a can of salmon. Weekly dairy consumption included one pound each of butter and cheese, 16 eggs, and 21 quarts of milk. Cereal included seven loaves of bread, 49 rolls, two boxes of crackers, 3.5 pounds of flour, and one box of breakfast food. Many various vegetables were consumed, but quantities are not specified for all of them. Examples include 4 quarts of potatoes and 1.5 pounds of apples. The diet included oranges, bananas, carrots, and unspecified other fresh vegetables. Finally is the consumption of 0.5 pound each of tea and coffee, 3.5 pounds of sugar, unspecified spices, a pint of whiskey, and an unspecified quantity of wine. One of the most extreme examples of low-priced food concerns the free lunches that were available at local saloons throughout urban America at the turn of the century. The urban working-class male could obtain enough free food for a filling lunch at saloons for the price of a five-cent beer. A typical saloon meal might consist of some rye bread, baked beans, cheese, sausage, sauerkraut, and dill pickles. The low price of the beer food package deal was made possible by subsidies from the liquor industry, which bought food in volume for the saloon keepers. By the 1920s, the American diet had made most of its transition from the hogs and hominy monotony of 1870 to the more varied diet, typically consumed today. Breakfast by 1920 consisted of citrus fruit, 
dry cereal and milk, or eggs and toast, followed by a light lunch of a sandwich, soup, and or salad, and a dinner consisting of meat or another entree served with potato and vegetable side dishes, and perhaps a light dessert, such as jello or ice cream. Dinner entrees no longer consisted simply of roasted or fried meat, but were influenced by immigrants from Italy, Germany, and Eastern Europe, who often cooked one-dish meals with multiple ingredients, such as stews, goulashes, or Italian pasta dishes, containing tomatoes, olives, sausages, and other ingredients. The immigrant tradition of consuming smaller quantities of meat mixed with other ingredients, such as pasta, potatoes, and vegetables, may play an important role in explaining the overall decline in meat consumption that occurred between 1900 and 1929 in Table 3-2. Another dimension of progress was in the increased variety of restaurants along with the rising incomes that led an ever larger share of the population, especially in cities, to escape their cramped living quarters. The rapid expansion of restaurants in the late 19th century ranged from upscale hotel dining rooms, serving 10-course meals cooked by French chefs, to more accessible and inexpensive ethnic restaurants, especially Chinese, German, and Italian. Soda fountains appeared in Woolworths and other chain stores, and ice cream, which had been invented much earlier, in the 1810s and 1820s, continued its growing popularity. My own city of Evanston, Illinois, lays a contested claim to the invention of the ice cream sundae in 1890. The automobile brought with it a transformation in food consumption that we usually associate with the 1950s and 1960s. By the 1920s, major highways were lined with drive-ins of varying degrees of rustic or metallic modern appearance, sometimes with female servers in uniform. Howard Johnson's nationwide chain of orange-roofed Georgian-style restaurants with its uninspired food was established in 1925. The first White Castle hamburger chain restaurant opened in 1921. From general store to supermarket, how food was sold. Our image of food retailing in 1870 is framed by the 75 to 25 division of the nation between rural and urban residents. In farm households, most food was produced on the farm, and a trip to the local general store was both time-consuming and a special occasion. The entire family would come along and spend its surplus of marketed food in trade for shoes, men's clothing, and fabrics for the women to use in making their own clothes. Prices were determined by haggling, and credit was the normal means of payment, with bills settled monthly or even less frequently if weather, insects, or other factors made local farming conditions difficult. Local general stores were often monopolies, more so in the very smallest towns, and less so as town size increased. The end of the Civil War transformed commerce in the rural South. Before the war, many transactions consisted of large purchases by plantation owners from wholesale merchants. During the war, popular consumer goods had been unavailable. The end of the war brought a rush of country merchants, eager to provide credit to an impoverished clientele. Farm families, both black and white, purchased as much as they could up to the credit limit set by the merchants. When the war ended, these customers were again ready buyers. Most Southerners were without money, but as a result of lien laws recently passed by the state legislatures, they were able to purchase astounding amounts of merchandise. Everywhere there was an anxiety to buy new goods, even if buying meant going hopelessly into debt. Where there had been one store before the war, there were now ten a flush post-war market, had created thousands of outlets. In densely occupied cities, housewives walked to nearby merchants. The larger the city, the more likely it was to have one or more centralized markets offering a cross-section of sellers, ranging from farmers who lived nearby to merchants selling specialized food and non-food items. By 1860, Boston and St. Louis had ten of these large markets apiece, and San Francisco had five. In 
The range of articles included not only a wide variety of food transported over substantial distances by rail, but also household products, such as brooms and baskets. In these markets, prices were set by bargaining, as in the rural general stores, but payment was in cash, reflecting the absence of the continuity of the relationship between the buyer and seller. Foreign observers approvingly reported on the almost endless variety of the choicest articles of food, meat, poultry, fish, vegetables, and fruits from all parts. There was a sharp dichotomy in the mid-19th century between the variety of food available to rural and urban residents. Within each city, the middle and upper classes could afford a more varied diet than working-class households. There was also a dichotomy in the prices paid, as rural families were often victims to price gouging by local monopoly country stores, whereas there was competition within the large urban markets between merchants, not to mention further competition between the markets themselves and ubiquitous street peddlers. Peddlers were, in effect, daily delivery men, selling dairy products, baked goods, meats, or produce. They also sold ice, coal, and firewood, and bought rags, scrap metal, and recyclable trash. At the beginning of the 20th century, roughly one-third of Americans lived in small towns, having fewer than 2,500 inhabitants, where town residents were free of the monopoly of the country store. These towns were large enough to have specialized merchants in a number of categories, including groceries, meats, and produce. Non-food shops included those selling harnesses, paint, bicycles, guns, books, and either female or male apparel. A description of a walk along Main Street of a small town in Texas evoked these reactions. He liked the smells here, the mothballs of textiles, the paint and grease of farm implements, the earthiness of vegetables, the leather of saddles, the food smells, making an unmistakable alloy of their own. Arriving in this retail milieu was one of the primary marketing innovations of 1870 to 1900, the chain food store. The A&P chain was originally founded in 1859 under a different name and renamed the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company in 1869. By 1876, the firm had 67 stores. Its period of most rapid expansion began in 1912. Around this time, A&P, which had previously provided delivery and credit, made the switch to cash and carry in the numerous, relatively small new stores that it opened. Soon, chain store and cash and carry became synonymous. After the 1859 founding of A&P, other major chain food stores were founded including the ancestors of the Grand Union, 1872, and Kroger, 1882, chains. Volume buying by the chains allowed them to undercut the prices of local merchants, and anti-chain store activists protested just as today's anti-Walmart activists protest, and for the same reasons, including the threat to small independent merchants. A difference in the late 19th century opposition to chain stores is that it did not involve labor unions, whereas today's resistance to Walmart in some cities is led by unions, which protest the steadfastly non-union makeup of the Walmart workforce. This transition to the new world of chain stores came to fruition in the 1920s. The leading national chain stores had 7,500 outlets by 1920 a number that quadrupled to 30,000 by 1930, of which 15,000 were operated by A&P. The chain stores tended to stock standardized national brands and had poor selections of locally grown produce, meats, and cheeses, which allowed specialty independent greengrocers, butchers, and bakery shops to survive. Chain stores were very small by today's standards and mainly stocked groceries, Customers lined up and waited while clerks fetched items from shelves behind them. Though lower prices were the main factor explaining the rise of the chain food store, other contributory factors included larger and more attractive stores, better locations, fresher merchandise, wider assortments, and use of advertising. <laughs>
Chain stores could obtain volume discounts, not just for merchandise, but also for equipment, and they were better capitalized and thus able to borrow money more cheaply so they could stay in business at a lower profit margin. However, just because new forms of food merchandising were being developed does not imply that all working-class shoppers flocked to them. Some continued to patronize more expensive neighborhood stores rather than buy from larger retail chains. Peter Shergold postulates that neighborhood stores were not only more personal and welcoming, but also allowed workers to purchase items on credit. However, because working men usually patronized neighborhood stores, they had to pay a substantial premium for foodstuffs because of the inefficiency of small stores. Small-town merchants had a small inventory and slow turnover that required them to price goods higher than merchants in larger towns. It has been estimated that their practice of extending credit raised their cost of doing business by roughly 10%. In effect, therefore, the persons who paid most for their foodstuffs were the group least able to afford it. One of the benefits of the automobile that will be treated in Chapter 5 was the freedom it gave to farmers and small-town residents to escape the monopoly grip of the local merchant and travel to the nearest large town or small city. Advertising developed in part as a result of mass production, Likewise, it was said that advertising made mass production possible. Firms decided that there was a limit to attracting customers to attracting customers through lower prices, and they tried the alternative strategy of increasing volume by brand-centric advertising. Although advertising began in the late 19th century with the development of the first branded products, its true explosion came in the 1920s, when it became increasingly tied to the newly invented radio. Butter, that everyday and commonplace product, provides an example of how mass marketers reacted to the 1906 Pure Foods Act and used it to their advantage to promote regional and national brands. Wrappers on butter in response to the new regulation provided a way for individual creameries to establish their identities. This replaced the previous practice by which individual farmers would imprint their cubes of butter with wooden stamps. One author laments the passage from individually flavored to standardized butter. This label is a haunting reminder of how butter devolved from a luxury product with the nuanced flavors of terroir to the standardized and relatively anonymous tasting product we know today. The marketing revolution for food that extended from 1870 to 1940 and beyond raises the likelihood that the increase in the standard of living has been understated. The history of the A&P chain of food stores in the early 20th century dramatizes the extent to which prices were lower in chain stores than in small mom-and-pop stores. Critics charged that A&P's prices were too low and alleged that the source of the low prices was large-scale deals from wholesalers and the development of in-house brands that eliminated the middleman. But the critics were complaining not about A&P, but instead, unknowingly, about economic development in a capitalist system, which allows the most efficient operators to replace small, inefficient, and sometimes incompetent country merchants and small family-owned urban stores. The reason the growth in the standard of living has been understated is that the Consumer Price Index, CPI, recorded price changes for each type of merchant separately and did not compare prices between types of merchants. Thus, if the price of a box of Kellogg's Corn Flakes remained fixed at 20 cents in March and April in a traditional store and was 17 cents in a nearby A&P store newly opened in April, the price would be treated as fixed. This error in the CPI is called outlet substitution bias and has continued in the past three decades as Walmart has opened stores that charge less for groceries than traditional supermarkets do. Fortunately, we can quantify the extent to which chain stores reduced food prices thanks to a survey that provides a price comparison between neighborhood stores, which would typically be patronized by working people, and chain stores in Pittsburgh in 1911.
This survey was conducted over several years by the University of Pittsburgh. From the data, we can calculate the log percent price reduction in chain stores compared to neighborhood stores, and this amounts to an unweighted average of negative 21.3% over 45 separately listed food items. To determine whether outliers are skewing the results, we can recalculate this price difference, excluding the 10 smallest and largest discrepancies, and the resulting mean of 25 food items is an even larger negative 23.5%. The chain store discounts appear to be larger for meat items, roughly negative 35%, and about negative 15% for staples such as sugar, flour, and canned fruits and vegetables. This evidence suggests that outlet substitution bias in the CPI occurring with the arrival of the chain stores in 1911 may have been quantitatively as significant as the arrival of Walmart in the 1980s and 1990s. In both cases, consumers were able to buy food items for substantially less. Yet the CPI and its predecessor price indexes track only price changes in a given type of outlet without counting as price changes the decrease in prices when a new, more efficient type of retail trade emerges as the result of innovation. Stay away from the milk and the meat, a jungle of disease and contamination. The previous section demonstrates that well before even 10% of American homes had electricity or an automobile, the foundations of the nationwide food manufacturing distribution and trademark system had been laid. However, throughout the 1870 to 1940 period and beyond, American households faced the risk of contaminated or adulterated food. Mary Ronald, editor of an 1897 cookbook, warned mothers that milk was a disease carrier and advised that all milk be boiled before being served to children. Kleinberg devotes considerable attention to the possible role of milk contamination as a factor helping to explain the rise in the infant mortality rate from 17.1% in 1875 to 20.3% 20 in 1900. Impure water supplies, impure milk, and inadequate waste removal all contributed significantly to infantile diarrhea. Almost all U.S. cities exhibited increased infant mortality during the hottest months, a pattern that disappeared only when rising standards of living resulted in the widespread ownership of iceboxes, when public health campaigns cleaned up milk and water supplies. The first pasteurized milk was introduced in Pittsburgh in 1907, and in 1913, the U.S. Department of Agriculture condemned a railroad for transporting milk in unrefrigerated containers. During previous decades, large, distant milk producers had driven out of business more than 700 dairymen who lived near Pittsburgh. Doctors blamed mothers for feeding babies bottled milk rather than breast milk and sometimes listed the cause of an infant death as bottle feeding. Henderson provides a detailed study of the milk problem in 1906, a time before the development of pasteurization when it was not uncommon in periods of milk shortage to stretch the milk by an infusion of water. The same year was also a landmark, for it was then that the first program of cow testing and regulation began. Soon afterward, cows were regularly tested for disease and quality of feed, and milk became pasteurized. By the decade spanning 1910 to 19, milk was sold in sealed glass bottles invented in 1886. Though daily delivery was necessary to compensate for the absence of adequate refrigeration in the home. Bettman provides a rich trove of anecdotes and illustrations that suggest the range of dangers of contamination in the 1870 to 1900 era. Milk was not only contaminated, but also diluted. Dealers merely required a water pump to boost two quarts of milk to a gallon. To remove the color and odor of milk from diseased cattle, dealers added molasses, chalk, or plaster of Paris. In 1902, the New York City Health Commission tested 3,970 milk samples and found that 52.8% were adulterated. 
Even bread was not above suspicion. New York City bakers in the 1880s stretch and preserved their dough with doses of alum and copper. Customers were continually enraged to discover chunks of foreign matter in their loaves, such as oven ash and grit from the baker's machinery. Worse yet were standard practices in the meat industry. The most famous protest against these conditions was Upton Sinclair's famous 1906 The Jungle, an account of the grisly conditions of production and employment in the Chicago meatpacking industry. He described unsanitary conditions in the making of sausage, and even implied that occasionally a worker fell into a vat and became part of the product. To disguise the smell of rotten meat and other food spoilage, food producers used additives to enhance the flavor, smell, and or color of food products. Some of the acids used to preserve meat turned out to be harmful to health. Despite the immediate response to the jungle in the development of food safety regulations, there were longer-lived effects of Sinclair's muckraking. The immediate response to the campaign inspired by the book was a halving of meat consumption. Even in the late 1920s, meat packers were still struggling to boost meat sales back to anything approaching their pre-1906 heyday, as shown in Table 3-2. This was not only because of the lingering effects of the jungle, but also because of the higher costs incurred by federal government inspection of all beef carcasses or products that entered into the interstate commerce. More generally, the new regulations furthered the speed of consolidation of food processing into a few large companies, for smaller companies could not afford to comply with the new laws. Several main conclusions emerge from our previous discussion of food that are relevant to the issues of safety and contamination. Safety was gradually improved as the result of the refrigeration of freight cars and the introduction of ice boxes in the home, the development of new canning and modeling technology, the beginning of a system of nationwide brand names for processed food, and the spread of chain food stores that reduced prices by purchasing in volume and introducing standardized methods that the local general merchant could not match. However safe many food products may have been, the scandals in the early 20th century surrounding the safety of milk and meat had long-lasting effects, especially on the quantity of meat consumed and on its cost of distribution. A generation of midgets. Why did people grow shorter? As a complement to the data presented thus far on quantities of food measured by inflation-adjusted value, by weight, and by caloric intake, we now turn to indirect evidence about food consumption drawn from biometric studies of stature and its relationship to nutrition and health. Richard Steckel provides a short survey of the literature on the relationship between human stature and both health and economic issues. Growth charts by age were originally used to establish a standard for normal growth from infancy to the teenage years. Studies have traced differences in height to nutrition, public health and sanitation, exposure to diseases, and the nature of physical work and exposure to hazards. There is a strong relationship between income and health, but it exhibits diminishing returns to higher income. After people transition from malnourishment to an adequate diet, they do not become taller, no matter how rich they are. The relationship between income and height extends beyond the provision of food to also include the ability to afford health care, as well as better housing conditions affordable to those who earn a higher income. Because deprivation stunts growth, whereas extreme affluence does not increase height, the average height of a given population declines with greater income inequality. Much of the biometric literature concerns differences across nations, while here we are interested in the evolution of stature in the United States over time. The most stunning result is that the adult height of native-born American males declined by more than 3%, from 68.3 inches for birth year 1830 to 66.6 inches for birth year 1890, after which there was a spurt to 69.6 inches in birth year 1940 
with little change after that. Why did height decline in an era when economic growth was so rapid and progress occurred along so many dimensions, including average per capita food consumption? The puzzle deepens when we plot male adult height by birth cohort against per capita calories of food intake, as in Figure 3-2. Though the overall slope of the line is positive, the observations for the entire period 1860 to 1920 are below the regression line, whereas those for the entire period, 1930 to 80, are above the line. Some aspect of American economic growth other than population-wide malnutrition must have caused heights to shrink after 1840 and to recover only slowly during 1890 to 1920. The explanations briefly listed by Steckel include rising food prices, growing inequality, damage from the Civil War, and the possible spread of diseases through urbanization and the proximity of children in the public schools that created the possibility of faster contagion. We postpone discussion of health-related causes until Chapter 7. Damage from the Civil War seems a dubious explanation considering that more than half the 1830 to 1890 decline in height had already occurred by 1860. The chronology of food prices is also no explanation, for food prices were lower in 1890 than in 1830, and then shot up in 1915 to 20, when height was rising most rapidly. Despite the claim by some that population growth outran food production between 1800 and 1860, and that this contributed to the 1830 to 1890 decline in height, the food production data does not support their claim. We have already examined the rise of per capita food consumption in the 19th century in Table 3-2. Clearly, American food production was sufficient to sustain a growing population. Based on the same scatterplot of height and caloric intake, reproduced in Figure 3-2, we conclude that food consumption cannot be the cause of shrinking height, and we instead point to the detriments of health and particularly those of infant mortality. The best evidence that non-food aspects of health were responsible for the decline in height is that infant mortality worsened as height was decreasing between 1830 and 1890. Put down the needle and the thread. The rise of market-purchased clothing. The issues that arise in the development of clothing and apparel consumption are less complex than those for food. The most important development in the interval 1870 to 1940 was the transition from home-produced to market-purchased apparel. In 1870, except for the upper-class women who could afford to hire a dressmaker or buy designer fashions, most women made their own clothes as well as a substantial fraction of their children's garments, and at least some of their husbands' clothes. Each woman was expected to sew. Indeed, such skills were indispensable throughout most of the 19th century. Dry goods and notions accounted for as large a share of the family budget as did purchased clothing in 1870, and only thereafter did the relative shares tilt increasingly away from dry goods and home production toward purchased clothing. Thanks to the expense of purchased clothing and the time needed to make home-produced apparel, most rural families made do with limited wardrobes. Men typically had one or two sets of sturdy, everyday items, and women a few simple one-piece dresses. Some, but not all, rural families had a single set of clothing for special occasions, such as church or funerals. Children were clothed in hand-me-downs within the family or from relatives and friends. By modern standards, clothing was typically dirty, thanks to the arduous labor of home laundry. Outerwear often went unwashed or uncleaned for months. Though farm women and working-class urban wives made simple dresses and frocks, middle-class women were under substantial pressure to make well-tailored outfits. They had to cut and sew their own clothes if they were to be respectably dressed, because there was no affordable alternative to doing it oneself. In 1844, the Ladies' Handbook declared that the female who is utterly regardless of her appearance may be safely pronounced deficient 
in some of the more important qualities that the term good character invariably implies. As middle-class fashions evolved after 1850 toward close-fitting garments with bouffant skirts and tight waists, women increasingly used paper patterns sold by specialized merchants or available in pattern magazines, but these were not sized, leaving sizing to a particular female's form a matter of guessing and experimentation. This historical record of the transition from dry goods to market-purchased apparel is summarized in figure 3-3. Dollars of expenditure per year per person are divided among three categories, dry goods and notions, clothing and personal furnishings, and shoes and other footwear. Total spending in the constant prices of 1913 grew from $11 in 1869 to $21 in 1899 and $30.50 in 1929. Notice that there was little growth between 1869 and 1899 in the dry goods and shoe categories, and that almost all the growth occurred in the clothing category. Then, between 1899 and 1929, spending on dry goods and shoes actually declined, whereas clothing expenditures more than accounted for the growth in total spending, as would be expected from the shift from clothing made at home to clothing bought from stores and catalogs. The arrival of immigrants from Eastern Europe after 1890 promoted the purchase of ready-made clothing, for many of the new arrivals were tailors. The development of machine-made clothing for the masses was wrought by pale, undersized, poverty-stricken East European tailors in New York who toiled incredible hours in dark, stinking workshop apartments or in fire-dangerous, dirty lofts, working with the fury and persistence of a people intent not only upon earning a living, but also upon demonstrating their right to live. The readily available archives of the Sears Roebuck catalog provide evidence of changes in female fashions. The catalog in 1902 displayed page after page of cloth and silk jackets, tailor-made suits, wash skirts, walking skirts, silk skirts, underskirts, silk waists, and ladies' wrappers all of which uniformly exhibited tight, even pinched waists with broad shoulders, loose-fitting tops, and flared or puffed-out skirts. These fashions shared in common the tight waists, but allowed for looser tops than the fashion typical of the 1870-90 period. Shortly after 1902, a new fad in women's clothing was in the shirtwaist, a blouse that fit tight at the waist, but that was fit looser on top an American innovation sniffed at by haughty Parisian dressmakers. Only five of these were listed in the Sears 1902 catalog, at prices between 50 cents and $1.65. Yet by 1905, the catalog listed no less than 150 models made from every conceivable type of domestic and foreign fabric. By 1919, this style had completely disappeared. Before 1890, virtually all skirts were floor length. The popularity of the bicycle first induced women to take the risk of wearing walking skirts that were less than floor length. This transition to shorter skirts occurred slowly over the two decades between 1890 and 1910. Perhaps one third of the skirts illustrated in the 1902 catalog are street skirts, shorter than floor length skirts by perhaps eight to 10 inches. It was only after World War I that skirt lengths began to shorten and by 1926 rose above the knees, and the catalog's skirts cautiously followed this fashion and evolved in the late 1920s, looking very different than they had in 1902. By 1927, the pinched waist was entirely missing. Dresses were boxy, hanging straight down from the shoulders with no waists at all a loose band around the hips, pleated skirts, and skirt lengths barely covering the knee. The boyish figure had become the fashion, and the boyish bob the accompanying hair fashion. Not only did women's fashion evolve steadily, but they also became more important as a focus of retail commerce. In 1902, the opening pages of the Sears catalog were devoted to pocket watches and watchmakers' tools reflecting Richard Sears's origin in the watchmaking business. But by 1925, 
women's clothing had taken over the opening pages. In the 1927 edition, fully 163 pages at the beginning of the book, compared to 53 pages toward the end of the 1902 book, were devoted to women's and children's apparel of all types, from fur coats to apron frocks to bridal wreaths. From general store to grandeur, the urban department store. In the America of 1870, local merchants had local monopolies, and their customers had little ability to compare prices. Thus, there was constant tension between the rural customers and the merchants, for there were few guidelines for judging whether a price was fair. It was dog eat dog, tit for tat. Our cottons were sold for wool, our wool and cotton for silk and linen. In fact, nearly everything was different from what it represented. Each party expected to be cheated, if it was possible. The tricks of the trade were numerous. This was not so much of a problem for standardized food products, such as butter and grain, for newspaper market reports provided some basic information on prices. But manufactured goods were not standardized and were susceptible to few benchmarks. National advertising did not begin to bring information about alternative goods and their prices until the end of the 19th century. In this environment, we can understand why mail-order catalogs were such a salvation for rural customers. Peddlers and itinerant merchants were not only omnipresent in cities, but also traveled to small towns and farms, selling a wide variety of specialized merchandise. Sometimes called jobbers, these intermediaries played the role of wholesalers and solved the problem for the country store proprietors about what to sell. For instance, jobbers were quickly to follow up on F.W. Woolworth's concept of the five and ten cent store and provided country merchants with cartons of mixed goods, such as crochet hooks, wash basins, baby bibs, watch keys, and harmonicas. The year 1870 was on the cusp of a revolution in the merchandising of clothing. The modern American department store found its roots in Boussicot's Bon Marché in Paris which by 1862 had developed into a grand emporium. Here originated many of the innovations that were part of the American counterparts from their beginnings. Fixed prices with no haggling, a money-back guarantee, a philosophy of low prices and high volume instead of the reverse, and a welcome to customers to browse without any moral obligation to buy. The development of the American imitators of Bon Marché was centered in the period 1870 to 1910, and their effect of lowering prices, much as had the chain food stores, created an improvement in the standard of living that was missed in the statistics on consumer prices and total inflation-adjusted consumer expenditures. The literature on the early department stores emphasizes their palatial, luxurious amenities modeled on their French ancestors. Long before electrification entered the working-class American home, electricity was adopted for lighting and other functions in the department stores. Electric elevators, electric light, and electric fans encouraged customers to visit the upper floors, helping management improve use of space and personnel. Electricity-powered pneumatic tube systems allowed centralized cashiers to provide receipts and make change. During this period, stores operated on a cash-only policy that allowed them to pay their suppliers rapidly, and they made most of their profits on discounts from suppliers. These temples of merchandise became the prime sightseeing destinations of their cities, not least in the case of Marshall Field's landmark State Street Building completed in 1907 with its Tiffany glass ceiling, both the first and the largest ceiling built of Tiffany's unique iridescent art glass, containing 1.6 million pieces. With the large investment required to build these urban palaces, the owners needed to find a way to draw the shoppers to the upper floors. Marshall Field had an entire floor of restaurants and cafes on its seventh floor sometimes with live musical performers to draw shoppers upward on the newfangled elevators. It and other major urban department stores attracted their prime female customers with reading and writing lounges. There were also post offices, beauty salons, nurseries, meeting rooms, 
and repair services. Shopping in these stores became an adventure in high art. Department stores became museums in which a status hierarchy of objects placed works of art at the top and encouraged the customers continuously to try and raise their standards. The pleasures provided by the owners of the department stores were augmented by the attraction of the new method of buying for urban housewives. Previously, women had to haggle with store owners and could not even see all the store's merchandise, some of which was hidden behind the scenes, partly for lack of space. Department stores had everything on display at a fixed price, and women, at least in large cities which had more than one such store, enjoyed their newfound ability to compare prices charged by different merchants. Most of the department stores remained single-store operations during the 1870 to 1940 interval. In 1929, R.H. Macy sold almost $100 million in its single 34th Street Herald Square store, with no suburban stores until the early post-war years. The first chain store devoted to clothing and dry goods was J.C. Penney, established in the unlikely location of a 25 by 45 foot space in Kemmerer, Wyoming in 1902. Steady growth allowed the chain to reach 14 stores by 1910, 312 by 1920, and 1,023 by 1929. Sears started later supplementing its catalog operation by opening retail stores starting in 1925. By 1929, it had 319 stores, far behind pennies, and in that year 60% of its sales were still obtained from its catalogs. The large and elegant Central City department stores were not the only innovation in non-food retailing during this period. Woolworth's variety store chain began with a single store in 1879 and was so successful that by 1911, there were 318 stores and enough financial backing for the proprietor to build New York's Woolworth Building, the tallest building in the world between its completion in 1913 and 1930. Three decades later, Walgreens Drug Store chain started as a single small store in 1909 but by 1920 had 19 stores. By 1929, it had 397. The variety in drugstore chains contributed directly to the rise in the American standard of living, just as did the mail-order catalogs, by providing a nationwide outlet for many types of specialized goods that might not otherwise have been produced at all. They made possible economies of scale and mass production in goods as diverse as notions and needles, doll furniture to pens, stationery, and writing equipment. Your money back with no questions asked. The mail order catalog. The benefits brought by the large department stores to urban dwellers were accompanied by equal or larger benefits to the majority rural population by the mail order catalog firms primarily those of Montgomery Ward and Sears Roebuck. Ward issued his first catalog in 1872, whereas Sears issued his first multi-hundred-page catalog in 1894, after dabbling in the mail-order sale of watches over the previous decade. Coming two decades before Sears, Aaron Montgomery Ward deserves the credit for revolutionizing rural commerce. He knew that rural customers needed an alternative to the tension-filled dealings with country merchants and peddlers. Thus, his philosophy was based on honesty, and his genius for converting each transaction into a risk-free proposition. Customers flocked to an alternative world of money-back guarantees and the acceptance of returns with no questions asked. Thus, catalogs did more than lower prices. They also increased the quality of each transaction. Because higher productivity of leisure time raises well-being, the catalogs raised the standard of living beyond the measurable price reductions they offered. It is no accident that both Sears and Wards were located in Chicago, because by then that city had established itself as the national railway hub, offering unmatched access to all parts of the country. Sears surpassed Ward's sales around 1900 by expanding into nearly every product line in existence.
By then, Sears was fulfilling 100,000 orders per day. The 1902 Sears catalog contained 1,162 pages. By then, Sears sold the full range of semi-durable goods, from elaborate hats to wigs to corsets to fur coats, as well as durable goods, from bicycles to banjos to central heating furnaces to guns. The only important category of goods not sold in the catalog was food, except for tea and coffee. The success of the catalogs in penetrating rural America owes a great debt to the introduction of rural free delivery, which began in the early 1890s and was fully implemented by 1901. Catalogs instructed their customers that they could just give the letter and money to the mail carrier, and he will get the money order at the post office and mail it in the letter for you. Parcel post service came along in 1913 and cut the cost of shipping of the catalogs, which by then were already well established, despite the need to charge for shipping. Then gradually, the spread of automobiles through rural America made it possible for farm families to venture farther for their purchases, and the growth of chain stores, including retail stores established by Sears itself starting in 1925, began to siphon off some of the customers for the catalogs. Nevertheless, the role of the catalogs in bringing the modern age to rural America cannot be overstated. From isolation and dependence on the local general store monopolist, each farm family now had the cornucopia of manufactured goods available at a glance in the catalogs. The explosive growth of circulation of the Sears catalog attests to its growing influence. Catalogs went to 3.6% of American households in 1902. 15.2% in 1908, and 25.7% in 1928. For the rural American, the change was crucial. Now he was lifted out of the narrow community of those he saw and knew, and put in continual touch with a larger world of persons and events, and things read about but unheard and unseen. Conclusion Could some of American growth be missed by the statistics? Food consumption advanced slowly along the dimension of variety, but not in terms of quantity, for calories consumed were actually fewer in the 1920s than in the 1870s. Clothing changed little in quantity or quality. Instead, the change was in the quality of work life for housewives, who by 1929 bought most of their clothes rather than making them out of economic necessity. Price reductions in marketed clothing accomplished both through manufacturing efficiency and the evolution of mail-order catalogs and department stores, together with higher household incomes, made it possible for women to buy rather than sew clothing. The slow growth in food and clothing consumption may be no paradox. Declining expenditures on these traditional necessities may have been a voluntary decision by households to make room in their budgets for purchases made possible by the new inventions. But there are good reasons to believe that the growth of food and clothing consumption were understated as the result of price index bias, in particular thanks to a failure to take account of lower prices obtained by consumers as they switched from high-priced country and neighborhood stores to chain stores for their food purchases. We have calculated that food prices of chain stores in 1911 were more than 22% lower than prices in traditional outlets, indicating a potential food price index bias of perhaps negative 1% per year over the first quarter of the 20th century, when chain stores became dominant. A similar bias may have occurred in clothing prices, thanks to the lower prices made available by the urban department store and by the mail-order catalog. But in addition to price index bias for food and clothing, there is a broader and perhaps more important reason why existing measures of real consumption per capita may understate the improvement in the standard of living. The benefits of the great inventions, from ridding the streets of manure to eliminating the hauling of water by urban and rural housewives to providing electricity for light, transport, and consumer appliances, have largely been excluded from GDP and thus hidden from view.
We turn in the next chapter to topics that involved far greater transformations of the living standard than food and clothing, namely the quantity and quality of housing, including the effects of the big four dimensions of improved quality, electrification, running water, indoor plumbing, and central heating. Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share, and comment.